Hello, I'm the doctor. Welcome to Dr. Geek. Today, I'm doing a special speed rundown of the second doctor for my 12 Doctors of Christmas special. And since he's my favorite doctor, this one was a lot of fun to make. Please be sure to check back tomorrow for my rundown of the third doctor and every day after that until Christmas. So like and subscribe to make sure you don't miss it. Just a reminder, there will be spoilers in this video. I will try not to say too much to make this go quicker, but I will reveal key plot points. With that said, let's pick up where we last left off. After regenerating, Polly and Ben are suspicious of the Doctor, with Ben going so far as to suggest that he's an imposter, but Polly believes it's still the Doctor. They leave the TARDIS and see a man killed. The Doctor finds a badge on him and learns that he was an examiner sent to inspect the human colony on this planet, and he decides to impersonate him. A security force escorts them to the colony, where the Doctor learns that Lesterson, the colony scientist, has discovered a 200-year-old alien spaceship. That night, the Doctor sneaks into the lab and opens the ship, revealing two Daleks, with a third one missing. Once the Doctor is gone, Lesterson reveals the third Dalek he's been hiding, and he works to reanimate it, thinking it's a robot. The Dalek comes alive and shoots one of Lesterson's assistants, so he removes the gunstock. When Lesterson shows the other scientist the Dalek, it repeats the phrase, I am your servant, and by all accounts seems nothing but helpful. But the Doctor is not fooled, and the Dalek makes signs of recognizing the Doctor, which convinces Ben and Polly that he is truly their Doctor. The other two Daleks are activated with their gun stocks removed, and they all begin to help around the colony. But the Doctor notices there appear to be more than three, and it is discovered that the Daleks are replicating themselves. The Daleks begin to attack the humans, but the Doctor realizes that they must run on static electricity and uses their power source against them, defeating the Dalek army. After the group slips away, they arrive in the 1700s to a battle between the British and the Scots, and are quickly taken captive by the Rubble Scots, where they meet a piper named Jamie McCrimmon. Together, they avoid being sold into slavery and help arm the Scots in their fight. Afterwards, Jamie decides to accompany the trio in the TARDIS. The TARDIS next materializes on a desert volcanic island, and they are soon captured again, this time by survivors from the city of Atlantis. They meet a man named Professor Zaroff, who is a scientist from the mainland and has a dream of raising Atlantis from the sea by draining the planet's oceans, which would destroy the world. Polly is taken to be converted into a fish person, but the Doctor learns of this and quickly cuts the power so she can escape. The Doctor decides to stop Zaroff by sinking Atlantis even lower, and Zaroff is killed when he refuses to give up despite the floodwaters. Next, in the year 2070, the TARDIS appears on the moon, and the Doctor hands out spacesuits to his companions so that they can play in the microgravity. However, Jamie is injured while playing, and members of the nearby moon base take him inside for medical care. They learn that the moon base uses a machine called the Gravitron to track and manage the weather on the Earth. Their arrival is ill-timed, however, as members of the crew have begun to collapse under the influence of an unknown pathogen. In the sickbay, Jamie wakes to see a large figure approaching him, and when Polly enters, she recognizes it as a Cyberman, who takes a sick man with him and leaves the room. The doctor can't figure out the cause of the disease, but when Polly makes coffee and infects someone else, the doctor realizes that the sugar has been poisoned. The Cybermen soon take over the base and reveal that their plan is to use the Gravitron to destroy all life on Earth. Jamie, Polly, and Ben mount a counterattack using nail polish for its ability to dissolve plastic, and they succeed in defeating the invasion force. But more are coming, and the Doctor points the Gravitron at the lunar surface, which blasts the Cybermen and their ships into space, saving the base. The TARDIS team next appear on an unnamed colony planet in the far future, but the Doctor is immediately uneasy about the seemingly fake nature of the society. Madoc, a half-crazed colonist, tells the Doctor that horrible insects roam the colony at night, and the two of them go exploring that night, finding the crab-like macro roaming the colony. They get discovered, and the Doctor and his companions are sent into the colony mines to mine toxic gas. The Doctor realizes that the deadly gas is vital to the macro, and the entire colony is just a front to enable gas production to take place, with the human colonists brainwashed into serving the macro while believing that they are obeying their control. Using a mixture of combustible gases and some manipulation of pipes that sends the mixture to the control center, the gas explodes and the macra are killed. The TARDIS next appears on the runway of Gatwick Airport, and after being chased by security, the TARDIS is confiscated. Polly slips into a hangar for chameleon tours and sees a man killed. 
She tells the others, but when they examine the body, the doctor discovers that he was killed with a weapon not found on Earth. They meet a girl named Samantha Briggs, who tells them that her brother left with this tour company, Chameleon Tours, on a trip to Rome, but no one ever saw him there, despite the fact that he sent them a postcard. Breaking into Chameleon Tours, they discover faked postcards from countless missing tourists. Meanwhile, the doctor learns from other airports that the Chameleon passengers never arrive, the planes always land empty. They learn that the Chameleon's plan is to repopulate their planet with 50,000 comatose people, having lost their identities in a catastrophe on their planet. The Doctor eventually negotiates the return of the humans in return for safe passage of the Chameleons. Upon returning to the TARDIS, Ben and Polly realize it is actually the same exact day that they originally left in the TARDIS, and they decide to remain on Earth. After saying their goodbyes, the Doctor and Jamie realize that the TARDIS has been stolen. They track the TARDIS down to an antique shop, but once there, they are drugged and dragged into a time machine by a Mr. Edward Waterfield. They are transported to the year 1866, 100 years later, where they are in the house of Theodore Maxtable, Waterfield's partner. The two men were trying to build a time machine when the Daleks found them, and stole Waterfield's daughter, Victoria, to force him to go into the future and steal the Doctor's TARDIS. The Daleks threaten to destroy the TARDIS unless the Doctor helps them isolate the human factor, the reason why the Daleks always lose to the human race. They will take this human factor and input it into three Daleks to create a new race of Super Daleks. The Doctor complies and creates three human-like Daleks, Alpha, Beta, and Omega, who he hopes will be friendly to the humans. The Daleks attempt to blow up Maxible's house, but the Doctor, Jamie, and Victoria manage to escape in the Daleks' own time machine to the planet Skara. Here, they meet the Dalek Emperor, who reveals to them that the plan all along was to isolate the Dalek Factor and use it to enslave the human race. However, the Doctor tricks the Daleks into programming themselves with the human factor, and they begin to rebel against the Emperor. In the firefight, Victoria's father is killed, and the Doctor promises to watch over her. The new trio sadly leave in the TARDIS. The TARDIS lands on the planet Telos, where an archaeological team is attempting to make first contact and the Tomb of the Cybermen, who died out centuries before. The expedition is funded by a woman named Kaftan, who is accompanied by her manservant Toberman and her colleague Klieg. The Doctor helps the team get inside the tomb and down into the crypt, but Klieg soon betrays them all and wakes the Cybermen up from their hibernation, believing that they will be grateful to him and become his allies. However, the Cybermen are not grateful and have just been waiting for someone smart enough to free them so that they could be converted. They manage to escape back out of the crypt, despite Captain attempting to lock them in, but Klieg manages to get back into the crypt and is this time killed by the Cybermen. The Cybermen kill Captain, which enrages Toberman and gives him the strength to defeat the Cyber Controller. After returning the Cybermen to their hibernation, the Doctor reseals the tomb and sets the trap again to be sure no one else will ever get in. The TARDIS next arrives in Tibet in the Himalayas, and the Doctor makes his way to a monastery he's familiar with in the area. Finding a body, the Doctor is accused of the murder by the man's friend and partner, Professor Travers, who is in Tibet to search for the abominable snowmen, or Yeti. However, the leader of the monastery, remembering the Doctor from his past visit, orders him to be released. The Yeti soon attack the monastery, and the Doctor realizes that they are actually robots. It soon becomes clear that the leader of the monastery is controlling the Yeti, due to he himself being controlled by the Great Intelligence. The Doctor and Jamie destroy the machinery used to control the Yeti, and the Great Intelligence loses his hold over the leader of the monastery, allowing him to finally die. Professor Travers leads the travelers back to their TARDIS, and leaves them as he runs off after a real Yeti. The team next show up at the Britannica base, in the future, where it is necessary to use an ionizer to slow the process of advancing glaciers, the opposite problem from the one that we ended up having. In the ice, the workers find the body of a man and excitedly bring it back to the base with them. However, when the man unfreezes, he is revealed to be an ice warrior named Varga from the planet Mars and demands to know where his ship and crew are. They soon find and revive four more ice warriors and they begin to free their ship. Eventually, despite a high chance of mutual destruction, the base uses their ionizer on the Martian ship, destroying it. The Doctor, Jamie, and Victoria are next relaxing on an Australian beach when a group of men tries to kill them. They are rescued, but told by their savior that the Doctor is a doppelganger of the most powerful and corrupt man in the world, Salamander. The Doctor is persuaded to impersonate Salamander to gather more information on his designs. 
Meanwhile, the real Salamander is trying to warn of an impending natural disaster in order to move himself into a more powerful position. But his warnings fall on deaf ears, as his predictions seem insane. However, sure enough, the events unfold exactly as he says they would. The reason for this being that Salamander has a whole colony of people living underground, causing natural disasters for him. Unknown to the people underground, Salamander has lied to them, telling them that the world is a nuclear wasteland and that what they are doing is for the good of humanity. When his plot is discovered, Salamander escapes into the underground caves, but a bomb is detonated and he explodes. However, upon arriving in the TARDIS, the Doctor cannot speak and tries to have Jamie set the TARDIS off by himself. But the real Doctor comes in just in time, revealing Salamander as an imposter. When Salamander tries to take off in the TARDIS without closing the doors, he is sucked out into the time vortex, and the Doctor, Jamie, and Victoria are left clinging to the console for dear life. After Jamie manages to get the doors closed, the TARDIS materializes in the London Underground, and the trio goes into the tunnels to explore. Seeing the Yeti, the Doctor realizes that the Great Intelligence must be back, and sure enough, they run into their old friend Professor Travers, who has aged 40 years since he last saw Jamie, Victoria, and the Doctor. The Yeti are covering the underground in a web-like fungus, and the military is doing their best to keep it under control, but with little luck. They are soon joined by Colonel Lethbridge Stewart, one of only two survivors from a Yeti attack, and he takes control of the operation. Meanwhile, the web fungus is continuing to spread, and the Yeti attack the base, kidnapping Professor Travers. Later, Travers, possessed by the Great Intelligence, tells the Doctor that he's lured him there to drain his mind of time and space, and if he does not comply, he will simply drain the Doctor's companions instead. The Doctor finally complies, but just as he's about to have his mind drained, Jamie destroys the machine, and the Great Intelligence is sent back out into space. However, the Doctor is furious, as he had tampered with the headset, and would have defeated the Great Intelligence once and for all had he been allowed to use it. The trio make a hasty retreat back to the TARDIS. They next appear on the sea, off the east coast of England, and they investigate a nearby beach that seems to be covered in sea foam, and a large pipe miked Euro Sea Gas. When the Doctor examines the pipe, using the sonic screwdriver for the very first time, he hears a heartbeat. The three are captured by the gas refiner Robson, and learn that there has been a drop-off in production. The Doctor offers to inspect the pipe for him, but he refuses. Slowly, the seaweed begins to take over Robson and drives him mad, leading him to take Victoria hostage as he transforms into a seaweed monster. The doctor realizes that Victoria's scream is able to make the sea foam retreat, and he rigs up a sound system to blast the foam with sound waves. After the creature is defeated, Victoria decides to stay in England as she has gotten tired of the constant peril. Jamie does not want her to go, but the doctor tells him that she must make her own decision. They give her a day to think it over before finally saying goodbye. Sometime later, the explosion of the mercury fluid link forces the Doctor and Jamie to evacuate the TARDIS to avoid mercury fumes, and until the mercury can be replaced, the TARDIS is marooned. They find themselves on an abandoned space vessel that is drifting towards a large space station shaped as a wheel. The wheel in space, as it is called, sees the vessel and becomes worried that it might hit them. They decide to destroy it, but Jamie manages to send a signal that they can pick up, letting them know that there are people alive on the craft. While the Doctor is resting, Jamie gets a tour of the wheel from the parapsychology librarian Zoe Harriet. The crew of the wheel are still worried about the space vessel, which still has the TARDIS on board, and they continue to contemplate destroying it. But Jamie sabotages their laser, infuriating the crew and making them defenseless against an incoming meteor shower. It is then revealed that the Cybermen are responsible for piloting this craft to the wheel, and they begin to send Cybernats to the wheel to eat through their supplies of a rare element called Bernalium. When the crew of the wheel sends people to the floating vessel to look for more Bernalium, the Cybermen are waiting for them and take them over. The Cybermen are then smuggled onto the wheel. They want the wheel intact so that they can use its radio beam for their fleet to home in on. They want to invade the Earth, desperate for the planet's mineral wealth. The Doctor, using a part from his TARDIS, repairs and boosts the power of the laser to repel the Cybermen fleet and destroy their ship. Afterwards, they are given the mercury they need to repair the TARDIS, and they return to the space vessel, with Zoe stowing away, determined to join them on their adventures. The TARDIS arrives on the peaceful planet of Dalkus, 
and they soon find out that a race called the Dominators have landed here as well. And they are using robots, called Quarks, to drill holes in the planet, with the goal of converting it into a rocket fuel for their ship. The Dominators capture Jamie and the Doctor, but the two feign ignorance and they are released for being too stupid to cause any trouble. The Dominators assume that they are Dulcians and are normal for their race. The Doctor works out that their plan is to drop a nuclear fission seed into one of the holes that they're drilling, converting the entire planet into a radioactive mass to power the Dominator fleet. They begin digging a tunnel to the central borehole to steal the deadly device as it falls down the hole, and they succeed, but the Doctor is unable to defuse it. Instead, he sneaks it back onto the Dominator ship, and they watch as the ship explodes shortly after takeoff. The explosion on Dulcus causes a volcano to erupt, engulfing the TARDIS in lava. To escape, the Doctor uses an emergency switch that pulls the TARDIS out of space and time, and out of reality itself. They arrive in a white void, and when Jamie and Zoe exit the TARDIS, they are met by white robots. The Doctor returns them to the TARDIS, but it soon explodes, leaving them to drift aimlessly. They find themselves in the land of fiction, where nothing is real, and they encounter many tests that they must pass. After completing them all, they meet the Master of Fiction, a writer who was led through the same test that they were when he first arrived. He explains that he is too old to continue, and he needs the Doctor to replace him. The Doctor refuses, and the two do battle with make-believe characters, with the Doctor winning and unplugging the Master Brain. The TARDIS comes back together, and they return to normality. The TARDIS lands in the late 20th century England, and the travelers attempt to find their old friend Professor Travers, but learn that he is away to America with his daughter. However, he left his home in the care of his friend Professor Watkins, who has mysteriously disappeared while working for the company International Electromatics. The Doctor and Jamie go to IE's head office in London to investigate, and there they are arrested and taken before IE's managing director, Tobias Vaughn. He tells them that Professor Watkins is at a delicate stage of his work and is refusing to see anyone. The Doctor is suspicious of this, noticing that the inhuman Vaughn never blinks once during their meeting. The two are then picked up by some military men and taken to see Lethbridge Stewart, now a brigadier, as he tells them about his recent interest in international electromatics. The Doctor works out that a cyber fleet is massing on Earth, and he tells the Brigadier he thinks that they are in the sewers. Soon enough, the Doctor has figured out the Cybermen's plans. They intend on using their ship, parked on the dark side of the moon, to boost their signals and beam them back down to Earth. When they come into contact with the circuits and the IE equipment, they will produce hypnotic signals that put the humans under cyber control. Suddenly, hundreds of Cybermen emerge from the sewers and start to walk the streets of London. Meanwhile, the cyber transport ships have started showing up on the radar and are mere minutes away. They debate using some missiles to take out just the leading transporters, but Zoe says that if they use all of their missiles, they can destroy 90% of the fleet using a chain reaction effect. The Major says that the calculations for that would prove too lengthy, but Zoe says she can do it in 30 seconds, which she does. The Cybermen react by deploying a Megatron bomb, but the Doctor destroys the homing beacon they need to deliver it. Instead, the Cybership tries to deliver it manually, and gets close enough to the Earth to be hit by their missiles, which destroy the fleet. The trio next lands on an unnamed planet, and they watch as a man walks out of a machine and immediately gets killed by a poison smoke. They go to try and warn some people, called the Gons, and find a group just as they are sending a young woman into the same machine. The people explain that they are sending their brightest pupils to their overlords, the Crotons, to be their companions, as they have done for centuries. But when they hear that the people are just quickly killed, they rush outside, where they have been told the atmosphere is poisonous, and rescue the girl just in time. The Doctor and Zoe decide to enter the machine to meet the Crotons, and find that they are an alien species that converts mental power into pure energy. They escape, but the Crotons demand their return in exchange for leaving the planet, so they are forced back in. However, this time, they bring a vial of poison, which they add to the Crotons' life support systems. This, combined with an attack by Jamie from the outside, results in the defeat of the Crotons and the freedom of the Gons. In the late 21st century, the TARDIS materializes in a museum dedicated to rockets, which are now an obsolete item since a new method of instant transportation has been invented, TMAT. The trio look around for a bit before being found by the owner, Professor Eldred, who demands to know why they're in his museum. But before they can talk too long, a Commander Radnor enters and asks Eldred for his help. 
There has been a loss of communication on the moon, and TMET is down. The only way to get back to the moon is by rocket, and he's the only person on the Earth who has one. Eldred agrees to let them use his rocket, but says he can't fly it himself. So the Doctor, Jamie, and Zoe pilot the rocket to the moon, where they discover that it's been taken over by the Ice Warriors, with the controller, Osgood, being killed when he sabotaged the T-Mat to prevent an invasion. The Ice Warriors use a repaired T-Mat to send seeds to cities all over the world, which soon explode, releasing a fungus that sucks the oxygen out of the air and makes the planet more suitable for the Martians. The Doctor discovers that water will destroy the fungus, which is used to the dry Martian soil, and they go to the weather station to make it rain. Using T-Mat to return to the moon, the Doctor alters the homing signal for the Ice Warrior fleet, sending them into the sun. And a last minute T-Mat by Jamie takes out the last of the Ice Warriors on the moon. Using T-Mat, the two get back to Earth and they say their goodbyes. They next arrive on Beacon Alpha 4, a space beacon that is about to be plundered for its stores of Argonite, a rare mineral. When the pirates arrive, they blow up the beacon, stranding the trio in one room, while the TARDIS drifts through space in another. They are saved by an eccentric miner, Milo Clancy, and what follows is a bunch of space pirate stuff that continues Doctor Who's precedent of having a really bad pirate-themed penultimate episode for their doctors. Finally, the TARDIS materializes on what looks like Earth in World War I, as they are found in No Man's Land and taken in for questioning but it soon becomes clear that they are in just one of many war zones that are spread out over a wide area. The men and women in the war zones are real soldiers, plucked from their time streams to fight in these simulations to create an army that can conquer the galaxy. To do this, they are aided by a member of the Doctor's race, much like the meddling monk. This one calls himself the War Chief. Joining forces with rebel soldiers who have broken their conditioning, the group bands together and they fight back to stop the war games. However, the Doctor realizes that he will need the help of his race, the Time Lords, to put everyone back in the times that they belong in. This is problematic though, because the Doctor is a renegade in a stolen TARDIS, and if the Time Lords find him, he will be severely punished. Still, he does what he must do, and sends a message to the Time Lords. But before he, Jamie, and Zoe can escape, they arrive, and they bring them all to Gallifrey, the Doctor's home planet. Here. The Doctor is put on trial for both stealing the TARDIS and for meddling in the affairs of countless civilizations. The Doctor pleads his case, telling them that he only meddled in times when it was truly important, and the Time Lords take time to deliberate, during which the Doctor leads Jamie and Zoe in one last half-hearted escape attempt that he knows will fail. Jamie and Zoe are forced to return to the moment that they first left with the Doctor, with none of their memories except for those of their first meeting with him and the Doctor is forced to regenerate and is exiled to the Earth without the memories of how to operate his TARDIS until the Time Lords see fit to give them back to him. So that was my speed run summary of the second Doctor's tenure in the TARDIS. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe for new videos every week, including a rundown of the third Doctor tomorrow and new videos every day until Christmas. As always, thank you for being my companion on this journey today. I'm the doctor, bye for now.